This article was recorded in audio for educational sharing on the floor. The Auro Audiobook Channel on December 26, 2022. ISSN 00912399095. Sex Information and Education. Sex and Racism by Robert Staples. Ph.D. Asterisk. The May 1974 issue of the ECU's report included 10 important position statements adopted by the ECU's board of directors. This article expands on the statement concerning sex and racism, which reads as follows. It is the position of S-ECU's that in any efforts aimed at identifying and improving a society's attitudes and understanding about racism, distortions of facts which are sexual in nature must be recognized and combated as such. Racism is frequently manifested by distorted views of the sexuality of other ethnic groups creating barriers to interpersonal relationships. Members of the stereotyped groups made themselves come to believe these racist sexual myths, so that the sexual southeast slash f concepts of both racist and victim are distorted, and they are denied the opportunity to understand appreciate and enjoy the sexuality to which all human beings are entitled. Some years ago Calvin Herndon wrote that the race problem is inextricably connected with sex. He cited the finding by Goodnar Newsordahl that white southerners thought that what blacks wanted most was intermarriage and sexual intercourse with whites. Herndon may have overstated his case since racism had a strong economic and psychological base which has kept the specter of racism alive long after the barriers to interracial sex and marriage were dropped. Yet, the relationship between sex and racism is not a spurious nor insignificant one. Even among the most enlightened whites, the association of blacks with an organic hypersexuality and hence, the morality lingers on in their collective consciousness. As with many cultural images of a group there is some validity to the white stereotype of black sexual potency if for no other reason than the self-fulfilling prophecy that if a group be reparatively treated or regarded in a certain way, its members eventually come to see themselves as others view them. The image of blacks as hypersexual beings is deeply rooted in American history culture and religion and is too complex to delineate here. In the early part of the 20th century respected scholars imputed a genetic basis to the all asterisk drive. Staples, a member of the Associate Professor of Sociology, San Francisco, U.S. slash ECU's Advisory University of Board, California, is Leg hotter sexual passions and richer fertility of the black population. Subsequent research has done little to invalidate the earlier generalizations about black sexual drives or to illuminate the socio cultural forces which differentiate between black and white sexual behavior. The result has served to foster and reinforce white stereotypes about black immorality and hypersexuality. Such false images serve to fuel the fears of those whites who remain psychologically wedded to America's puritanical view of sexuality.
and to galvanize their resistance to black demands for equal opportunity in American life. Any objective examination of black sexual behavior would reveal that there are many variations in the type and frequency of sexual activity in this group. That any racial differences can be charged to cultural and class differences rather than to innate biological traits. And that changes in time and space have brought about a convergence in the sexual attitudes and behaviors of the two racial groups. Furthermore, it is instructive to know that the white fear of black hypersexuality stems from a racism and sexism against which blacks and women must constantly struggle. To be specific, the white group's resistance has been to black male-slash-white female sexual liaisons. Historically, white males had sexual access to black women through force or economic inducement. In this transaction black women were often unwilling partners whereas white women and black men violated the taboo on their sexual union at the risk of their freedom or lives. Ergo, we find insignificant differences between black and white male sexual attitudes and behavior. The dissimilarities exist between black and white women, disparities that can largely be explained by the lack of a strong double standard among black males. The common white male practice of dividing women into good and bad types according to their virginal status did not exist among blacks. As a result, Black women have historically been more likely to receive satisfaction from their premarital and marital sexual relations. In spite of this, not all black women are liberated. As a response to their sexual image, upwardly mobile and middle class black women often operate under the same sexual constraints as do white women with some of the same consequences, sexual unresponsiveness and orgasmic dysfunction. For to many black men, the internalization of racist sexual beliefs has led to a different response, one of preoccupation with their sexual prowess to the neglect of their many other talents. The mass media have collaborated in this process by their own emphasis on the super stug quatim. Continued on page 14. Sex education recently. The Westport school system has been giving a course in sex education to the fifth grade. The program consists of a film strip, the record and question and answer session. The boys and girls met separately and were shown different film strips. What each session amounted to basically was this. The boys learned that they had penises and were boys. The girls learned that they had vaginas and were girls. The kids could have spent one minute naked in front of a mirror and found out as much and possibly more than the film strip presented. Assuming that they would get a lot of obscene questions and embarrassment, the teachers passed out cards on which the students were to write their anonymous questions. The teachers got just what they dot bargained for. A lot of obscene questions and embarrassed looks from the anonymous writers. When the children asked questions about the opposite sex, the teachers skillfully avoided answering them directly. We learned more about embarrassment than sex that day. During the film strip that I saw, the boys acted bored and squirmy. The reason I think the kids asked obscene questions. 
is a lag is because they were trying to pet up a boring situation. I admit, I asked an obscene question myself. The people who made the film strip should have used real photographs of the male and female sex organs, not the blunt and imprecise drawings that made a penis look like a baggy. It seems to me that both the boys and girls should have viewed the film together, one that incorporated information about both sexes. Maybe that would have been embarrassing. But once the children had regained their senses after the blast, they would really be able to appreciate how much they had learned. Maybe if the filmmakers had had the nerve to prepare and present such a film, sex would no longer be a giddy subject for the fifth graders. Adam Weissman asterisk asterisk Adam School Reprinted Westport. Weissmann Westport was a fifth grade student at the BirdCon when he wrote this editorial from May 8, 1974 issue of Farms. With permission, Connecticut Fair Press. SIECUS has moved SIECUS address is now settled in its new offices at the following volume I I I number 5 May 1975 SIECU Suite 9 to 2122 East 42nd Street New York New York 10017 phone Area code to one two six six one seven zero one zero. This new address in the Grand Central Area is centrally located for anyone wishing to visit the SIECU's offices. We gratefully request SIECU's report readers to know this change of address in bibliographies and other sources where our old address has been listed. Orders for SIECU's publications will continue to be handled by our distributors. Behavioral Publications, 72 Fifth Avenue, New York New York 10011 The SIECU's report sold on a volume September is published basis only be monthly subscriptions with volumes beginning are in subscription rates individual $9 for one year Canadian and foreign ten dollars and fifty cents institutional fifteen dollars canadian and foreign sixteen dollars and fifty cents single copies of any issue two dollars and fifty cents institutional three dollars and fifty cents Queries about subscriptions and delivery should be sent to behavioral publications 72 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York 1011. Editorial queries should be sent to SIECUs at the address below. S slash ECU's report is available on microfilm from University Microfilms, 300 North Z Road, Ken Harbor. Milliliters 48106. Editor Mary Managing. S. Calderon. Editor Her. M. D. L. Bert Listen. Dead. D. Copyright 0 1974 by the Sex Information and Education Council of the U.S. Incorporated. 122 East 42nd Street, New York. Ben White 10017
Library of Congress Catalog Card Number 72 to 627,361 Part of the S Slash ECU's Report Without Written Permission Office No May be reproduced from the SIEC use in any form publications. SIEC use report May 1975. Do you important sexual and new marital journals in counseling? Louisiana reconsider sex education ban. Three new journals of embarrassed to counselors and researchers have appeared in the last six months. The Journal of Homosexuality CSR March 1975 The Journal of Marriage and Family Counseling CSR November 1974 and most recently the Journal of Sexual and Marital Therapy under the editorship of Helen S. Kaplan, M.D., Ph.D., Clifford J. Sager, M.D. and Harold A. Lear, M.D., the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy states in its first editorial that it's a forum for emergent ideas and objectives are to provide new clinical work in sex and marital therapy, to provide a vehicle for communication and cross-fertilization, and thereby to help professionals keep abreast of new developments. The selection of its articles is to be governed by our objectives and our multidisciplinary, eclectic, and open-ended orientation. It is our concept that human sexual functioning is a multiply determined phenomenon and that the roots of the sexual disorders and of marital disharmony are diverse. Our primary focus is clinical and therapeutic. It is planned whenever feasible to focus an entire issue or part of an issue on particular areas that can be examined in depth by a number of authors. Its second issue, Wintergrave Accent 74, is devoted to female sexuality. Contributions are welcomed, as are criticisms, suggestions and letters. Address the editors, Howard Slash of Sex and Marital Therapy, 65 East 76th Street, New York, Ben White 10021. Subscriptions for this quarterly are on an academic year basis, $15. Order from Behavioral Publications, 72 Fifth Avenue. New York. Ben White 10011. Repeal of the ban on sex education in the public schools imposed in 1968 by the Louisiana State Legislature has been recommended by a special panel appointed to study the issue. While repeal of the ban is the central recommendation, the panel's report contained many qualifications make it the local option for school systems, incorporate the subject in other curriculum areas as a phase of character education, and avoid teaching materials from SIEC use. Commenting on this recommendation to repeal the ban on sex education an editorial in the New Orleans Times PK on states. Louisiana is one of only three states without some kind of public sex education curriculum, and the same conditions that have argued for sex education elsewhere apply fully here. The demonstrable abysmal ignorance and immature attitudes of young people whose elders tend to believe are so far ahead of earlier generations that they already know all about it and need to be stopped rather than taught. The editorial concludes with
the legislature should make the road clearing decision to repeal the statewide ban and let school boards and parents get on with their necessary work. Right to teach birth in Michigan control schools denied AASEC establishes certification for sex therapists American Association of Sex Educators and Counselors AASEC has announced procedures for certifying qualified sex therapists using the criteria developed in the professional training and preparation of sex counselors published in 1973. The Sex Therapy Certification Committee, chaired by Albert Ellis, Ph.D., has outlined both content and clinical experiences necessary for certification. The Grand Personal Clause has been established to enable those currently practicing as sex therapists to be certified. Other members of the Sex Therapy Certification Committee are Leroy S. Graham, Ph.D., James Leslie Meet Carey, Ph.D., Armand de Moya, M.D., Dorothy de Moya, R.N. The A. Warren J. Cadpale. M.D. Ulysses Grant Turner. I.I.I. M.D. William R. Staten. Ph.D. Patricia Schiller. The A. I.D. Leon Zeusman. M.D. Shirley Zeusman. Ed. D. David. Darmais. Ph.D. For further information about certification of both sex therapists and sex educators, write to AASCC 5010 Wisconsin Avenue, NW, Suite 304, Washington, D.C. 2016. SIECU's report, May 1975. A closely watched test case in Michigan challenging a statute that prohibits discussion of birth control in Michigan's public schools was dismissed in federal district court in July 1974 for reasons of lack of jurisdiction. On appeal this decision has been affirmed without opinion by the U.S. Supreme Court. The case, brought by a physician and a teacher in Detroit on grounds that the statute was a violation of First Amendment rights of free speech, was dismissed because the plaintiffs failed to prove that their constitutional rights were actually challenged by any threat or reprisal for their actions or speech in connection with sex education courses they taught. The plaintiffs argued that the very fact the statute was on the books was a restraining and inhibiting influence on their teaching. Since no specific charge was brought against the plaintiffs, the federal district court ruled there was no actual case to be adjudicated. Therefore, the complaint was dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. Another legal decision, however, has ruled that the Michigan statute restricting dissemination of birth control information in schools does not apply to newspapers, including school newspapers. The Ann Arbor Community High School newspaper which had been restrained from publishing such information in the past now has clearance to print information on birth control. 3. WHRDTHEACTIO and an innovative approach to sexual morality The research of Harvard psychologist, Lawrence Kohlberg 
into the stages of moral development is attracting more and more interest by educators who have long espoused the goal of promoting moral and ethical values, but who seldom could offer anything except precept and example as a means for achieving that goal. Moral education has traditionally been directed toward influencing behavior to conform to cultural rules or norms. Kohlberg and his colleagues have challenged the view of morality as conformity to group standards. Rather they argued, based on their empirical and cross-cultural research, that moral development occurs with a child's growing ability to reason about moral problems resulting in the formulation of more universal and consistent moral judgments on his slash her own. Kohlberg has identified six stages of moral development ranging from judging the rightness or wrongness of an act on the basis of fear or punishment to judging an act based on self-chosen ethical principles of justice that are universal. While progress through the stages of moral development are related to a child's cognitive development, such progress does not occur automatically as does, say, physical development. According to Kohlberg, Moral development occurs through a process of restructuring modes of role-taking. As children mature morally, they are able to increase their role-taking ability and thus expand their perspective beyond their own immediate situation, or their own social group. The pedagogical implications of Kohlberg's theory of moral development have direct application to the issue of sexual morality as it is treated in sex education programs at all levels. The research abstracted below conducted by Mary E. Spiker for her master's degree at Purdue University was among those submitted in the 1974 SIECU's research award program. Asterisk. In this empirical study she has shown how confrontation with ethical dilemmas relating to sexual behavior can, in a structured setting, lead to higher levels of moral reasoning about sexual behavior. Ms. Spiker is currently pursuing her doctoral studies under Professor Kohlberg at the Center for Moral Education, Harvard University. Is Zion method in stimulating positive developmental changes in the sexual moral reasoning of later adolescent undergraduate college students. The random sample of 40 undergraduate students, drawn from over 600 students enrolled in a family life education course at a Midwestern university, participated as SS in this experiment, which was conducted over a 14-week period. An experimental group N equals 20 participated in a 10-week, 10-session series of moral discussions about sexual dilemmas, as well as in the lecture portion of the course. The dialectical technique of discussing moral dilemmas was used, and was designed to induce cognitive conflict in SS current level of moral reasoning and to expose SS to principles evolving from higher level stages of cognitive moral development. A control group N equals 20 did not participate in the moral discussion groups and were exposed only to factual information about the subject matter during the 14-week period. Analyses of covariance with pretest scores on sexual and standard dilemmas as the two covariates indicated that moral discussions of sexual dilemmas led first, 
to significant post-test differences between the experimental and control group on both sexual and standard moral judgment and second, to a significant increase in both sexual and standard moral judgment in the experimental group as compared to the control group. Additional analyses of covariance indicated no significant sex differences in either post-test moral judgment or pre-test to post-test changes in moral judgment. References Blatt, M. and Kohlberg, Zion upon Children's Quarter slash Y. 1969 L. The Effects of Classroom Moral Discourse Meryl Palmer Level of Moral Judgment 8. Logical Operational Limitations of the Development of Moral Judgment Unpublished Doctoral Dissertation, Columbia University, 1972 Seligan, C. Kohlberg, L. Lerner, I. N. B. Lenke, M. Moral Reasoning About Sexual Dilemmas, The Development of an Interview and Scoring System. Washington, D.C. President's Commission on Pornography and Obscenity, 1970. Kohlberg, L. The Development of Modes of Moral Thinking and Choice in the Years 10 to 16. Unpublished Doctoral Dissertation, University of Chicago, 1958. Kohlberg, L. Development of Moral Character and Moral Ideology. In Hoffman, Ment Research. M. and Hoffman, L. PDS. Volume 1. Russell Sage Review of Child Develop Foundation. 1964. Colby. Stimulating Change in Moral Judgment. The Mental Validation of an Innovative Educational Approach to Sexual Morality by Mary Elizabeth Spiker. Hyperia. Kohlberg. L. Stage and Sequence The Cognitive Approach to Socialization In David A. Goslin Socialization Company, 1969 Theory and Research Chicago Developmental Education Handbook Grand McNally Capith and An Abstract Developmental moral discussions have been shown to lead to marked and relatively enduring increases in the moral reasoning of early adolescents Black and Kohlberg, 1969, Colby, 1973. As a further investigation of the Black and Kohlberg 1969 approach to moral education, the present study empirically tested the effectiveness of the moral discourse for Kohlberg, L. Moral Development and Education of Adolescents In E.D. Heaven's Education Adolescents Readings in Behavior and Development Hinsdale, Gill, The Dryden Press, Incorporated. 1970. Kohlberg, L. and the Real, E. Moral Development and Moral Education. In G. Lesser Education Psychology and Educational Practice. B. of A. Chicago, Scott J. The Moral Paul, 1932. Winners Issues Forsman Judgment and Company. 1971 of the child london england kerrigan asterisk award previous band of the honorable siec use mentions report have been abstracted in
FIECU's report May 1975 One book reviews the North 1973 Sexual Adolescent Soul Gordon Situate them a Duxbury Press 206 pages seven dollars and fifty cents three dollars and ninety five cents paper by michael a camera dead dot d dot reviewed take a lot on faith or will have to do a great deal of reading to evaluate the validity of the arguments Dr. Gordon obviously feels that being scientific does not mean refraining from judgments. This is a useful book for those working with young people. It confronts directly many of the crucial issues parents and those in the helping professions must recognize and understand. If they expect to help adolescents see for themselves the choices which are best and right, as they move closer to fulfilling their unique and individual potentials. APPR There are 24, with 495 pages. Not only do the discussions at the end of each section fail to connect the different parts of the book, but also there is no general summary or outline, and the index is poorly conceptualized and unhelpful. A major criticism of this book can be found in one made at the conference by Joseph Zubin as summarized on page 191. Dr. Zubin stressed the need for precise definitions of sex commenting that none had so far been offered, despite the fact that sex-related behavior was the central focus of the conference. To emphasize methodological problems in the sex difference field, he cited two commonly practiced errors in data analysis, one ecological and one clinical. The ecological fallacy is propagated by sociologists who infer differences on the basis of comparisons between the means of large groups. The clinical fallacy is propagated by those who infer differences by comparing small series of individuals. He underscored the need for definitive studies focused on sex differences based on large random samples rather than observations of differences called in directly from research primarily directed at other goals. Despite its title, this book does not focus these definitive studies on sex differences in behavior. Nonetheless, like a well edited, hard-covered specialty journal, with good contributions from many major researchers, the book will be needed as a reference in the sexological section of all libraries, public and private, PR asterisk by invitation. Birth Catherine, New York, Harmony Paper, $5.95 Reviewed by Melitner, New York, Books, 1974, 304 pages. In his book The Sexual Adolescent Soul Gordon strides through the portals of adolescence like a gunman entering a saloon and challenges us to examine sexuality and young people from his perspective as an educator and psychologist. Written from the vantage point of an advocate of youth, this book is bold, lively, and directive. It, therefore, does not invite diversity of opinion. This may make some people unhappy, but Dr. Gordon never set out to attract approval, to palliate or to soothe feelings. He quite simply presents facts about adolescence, 
their sexual behavior, their needs and concerns, and then discusses a role parents and people in the helping professions should play in facilitating communication with young people during that stage of their life which contains some inherent dangers. In this succinctly written book Dr. Gordon successfully breaks through years of calcified and blind spot thinking regarding adolescents, their rights, what they know and what they don't know. The sections on adolescent pregnancy Venereal disease, abortion and contraception present in no uncertain terms how Gordon sees the facts, their implications for young people and how these issues should be dealt with. The sections on alternative ways of educating for sexuality are presented in snapshot fashion and make one realize the diversity available in delivering information and education about sexuality. The Appendices Resources Reference section and glossary are extremely worthwhile for those involved in developing and implementing programs with young people. There are several points in the book where the reader's appetite is whetted sufficiently to warrant more balanced and tightly woven arguments. Instead there are somewhat oversimplified analyses where the reader who does not have extensive background will have to SIECU's report, make 1975, Sex Differences in Behavior. Richard C. Friedman, Ralph M. Richard, Raymond L. Van Wheel, EDS, New York, New York. John Wiley and Sons, 1974, 495 pages, $25. Reviewed by O.H. and Lean Daily, M.D. Asterisk Money, Ph.D. And this book is the result of a 1973 conference sponsored by Columbia University's International Institute for the Study of Human Reproduction. As is typical of most conference proceedings, there are some striking omissions. For example, there is no mention of sex differences in erotic arousal or copulatory response in human beings. In fact disproportionate attention is given to non-erotic sex differences. Even sex researchers are affected by the taboo on fucking in our society. The insidious effects of this taboo affect even terminology. For the term, gender identity, is used as the subtitle of section 5 as though to refer to something exclusive of eroticism. Other section headings are, stress and early life experience in non-humans, early mother-child interaction in humans, development of sex differences in behavioral functioning, aggression adaptation and evolution, and perspectives on psychoendocrine differences. Only in the first section effects of hormones on the development of behavior, does some kind of correlation appear between the chapters, of which Lorna 5 Flint the A I really wanted to like this book about childbirth because it was written by someone who had actually given birth. Most of the better books for expectant parents, while medically informative and useful, are either very impersonal five or downright condescending volumes written by male obstetricians who can't only conjecture about how a labor contraction or a baby kicking inside a womb really feels. 
Catherine Millinaire wanted to write a different kind of book. As a photojournalist, she could add the most human dimension through her particular skills. As a mother, she knew what interested her in the birth process. The unique parts of the book interviews with parents about their childbirth experiences, and a discussion of birth customs around the world also seemed to be the ones of most interest to the author. If only she had left the technical aspects of childbirth to other sources. Much of what she presents is too confusing, too brief and too earthy to be useful to urban dwellers. She is a devout believer in the curative powers of her bolties, some of which like Lobila are more dangerous than helpful. The medical information was all too briefly reviewed by a physician named Joseph Berger. The chapter on fetal development is especially poor. Ms. Merlinaire adapted some of Deaconson's drawings and turned them into what appeared to be confusing paint by the numbers forms. The author asserts that she is presenting choices of ways to give birth with or without anesthetic, at e.g., home or in the hospital but she clearly favors home delivery. Her interviews with hospital delivery mothers make these experiences all seem very mechanical, while those at home were all joyous and natural, with friends drinking wine singing, chewing POD buttons, and celebrating. Even the stillbirth WHICHI interpreted as being preventable had the woman been in a hospital WAS not seen as so great a tragedy. Anyway, it was easier to have this trip go down in a home, rather than in a hospital. I was surrounded by the people who loved me, who cried with me and who didn't make me feel ashamed over so much emotion. I wasn't shut away in a sterile little room with a perfect view of beaming new mothers. A highlight of the book is the warm and humane photographs, some of which were taken by Ms. Merlinaire and others by the couples during childbirth. The section on caring for the newborn is modern and practical and reminds new parents that they don't have to spend a fortune on so many of the 86 varieties products. It also contains many of the same exercises which I know the YWCA uses in its gym and swim classes for infants. I asked a pregnant friend to read the book in the context of the many childbirth books she had recently digested. She found it to be naive and unrealistic with its definite prejudice toward home delivery. While agreeing with my analysis, she was more critical of the information imparted. But she did feel that it provided a different input on childbirth, and certainly will reach an audience that would tend to screen out completely the more traditional childbirth books. I cannot recommend this book to be the only one a couple reads in preparation for childbirth. However, if read in conjunction with the Boston Children's Hospital book or with Gut Mocker's Pregnancy, Birth and Gamely Planning and Our Buddies Ourselves, it provides a new dimension. Perhaps young couples living close to nature will find this book especially to their liking. I think that most importantly, it raised my expectations for more humane treatment from my own obstetrician. It reminded me that I have a choice, even if it isn't to deliver my baby at home. AP Male and female under 18.
Nancy Larrick and Eve Merriam. Editors New York. New York. Avon Books. 1973. $1.95. Papered. Reviewed by F. Allen 5. Gentle. M.D. Running an advertisement in junior and senior high school papers. Approximately 2,500 young persons responded to this advertising most with return home addresses, not school addresses, indicating that their contributions were personal statements and not a classroom writing assignment. There is no question, in my opinion, that the collection of sometimes labored, sometimes spontaneous but always thoughtful responses will have significant impact on any adult who chooses to read it. For the peers of the youthful contributors it represents many voices f-r-o-m the most unliberated to the super liberated boy and girl. If though you have ever had doubts that children and young persons 8 to 18 years of age were knowledgeable about adults, forget them. They are also candid questioners of themselves, in ways that adults could emulate for their own benefit as well as for the young with whom they work and associate. Some of the contributors' comments are penetrating enough that more than one of the efforts of some appear in this book. The overall views expressed, however, reflect the mosaic of ethnic, economic, geographic and social patterns of the United States plus one from New Delhi, India formerly of Lincoln. Nebraska as she emphatically notes who is right two years of age. I recommend this book for teachers, parents, students of all ages and for other professionals in the field of human sexuality. Yet Lieutenant P. Reviewing this book further clarified a concern I have had for some time that the villain of sex problems at any age is sex role stereotyping. The authors, in developing this thesis, have collected the special thoughts of young men and women under 18 years of age, some as young as 8 and as old as just 18 on being male and female in today's culture. What these young people have to say about themselves, their families, their peers and the world out there is exhilarating, sad, awesome and exquisitely hopeful. The editors are both teachers, poets, authors, and anthologists. Ms. Merriam edited Growing Up Female in America, and Ms. Lerick has edited two anthologies of young people's poetry, as well as parents' guides to children's reading. Together they solicited poems and prose from under 18 s on what it means to be a man or a woman today, by learning sex roles. American and Scandinavian Contrasts Joseph E. Riedel New York New York Canfield Press Harper and Row 1974 288 pages $4.95 paper Reviewed Ph.D. by Derek D. Calderwood this case book is the result of an excellent idea, a comparison of sexual learning and behavior within the framework of sex roles of young adults from the United States, Sweden and Denmark. Twelve American students, six female and six male recall their sexual experiences and their feelings about them from the earliest years they could remember.
up through adolescency and into young adulthood. Each American student's account is followed by a reaction and comparison of experience by a Swedish and Danish young person of the same sex. The American students are refreshes the ECU's report, make 1975, Ingle Frank. The Scandinavian students, although at times sharply critical of all things American, follow their lead and are equally open in expressing their feelings and recounting their experiences. As with most case histories there is more we would like to know about each individual, but what is revealed provides a wealth of material for discussion. The material is arbitrarily arranged. The book is divided into three sections, childhood, adolescence and adulthood, but since each case history covers all three developmental stages. This is an artificial categorization. Questions aimed at the college-level student have been inserted at points the author feels are significant, but I think most students will find them intrusive. Despite the somewhat mechanical arrangement, the content is of real value and the book should prompt stimulating and worthwhile discussion. Lieutenant APR Homosexuality Shining Mark Brooks Slash Cold Paper Reviewed and Psychological Friedman Belmont 1971 124 pages Funksika two dollars and ninety five cents by a slash and pb slash slash ph dot d dot a great deal is packed into this 124 page paperback dealing with the relationship between homosexuality and psychological functioning short descriptions of what homosexually oriented men and women do sexually and the terms that are used to describe their sexual practices a short review of several etiological theories with the suggestion that the development of a homosexual orientation is best explained as the result of a person's positive association with homosexual style and the examination of the various you like ways in which normality may be construed including a not entirely successful attempt to discuss the value of Herzberg's motivation hygiene theory for an understanding of psychological functioning and homosexuality, a comparison of homosexuality and heterosexuality with a special emphasis satisfactions associated with upon homosexuality which are less often found within the other sexual orientation. Brief descriptions of the results of 13 studies conducted from 1957 to 1970 which indicate that homosexuality is not ipso facto pathological, and the author's own study of homosexual and heterosexual females SIECU's report, make 1975 which not only confirms the impressions drawn from others' work but which suggests that in certain respects homosexually oriented females function better than their heterosexual counterparts. The text, which includes nine briefcase illustrations of the points the author makes, Ends with the inevitable conclusion that homosexuality and heterosexuality are per southeast poor predictors of psychological adjustment, and with the plea that we respect individual differences in regard to differing sexual patterns and orientations. Given the long history of thought which took for granted the poor psychological adjustment of homosexual persons, 
and the recently successful efforts of gay liberationists to gain parity with heterosexuals by having their sexual orientation stricken from the American Psychiatric Association's Manual of Mental Disorders. The present book is not only understandable, but worthwhile. It is possible, however, that we have reached the point where we can say, so what? To the kind of message which the author so urgently addresses to his reader. Each of us inhabits a culture which, if we were human enough, should probably be driving us crazy. Perhaps everything antithetical to being the human being accounts for our relatively high scores on happiness measures, for our ability to master a basically sick environment, for our smug self-satisfactions. My only hope is that the measures used in the kinds of studies to which the author refers have failed to tap levels of alienation within homosexuals and heterosexuals alike which could be considered legitimate and worthwhile outcomes in human beings deserving of more. And if all the truth were known. Perhaps we would end up applauding whichever group turned out to be more out of step, more out of place, more unhappy, given the present state of human affairs. APR Sex and Sensibility The New Look at Being a Woman Elizabeth M. Wellen New York McGraw-Hill 1974 174 pages six dollars and ninety five cents reviewed by Matt strong dr. Wellen begins with the premise that responsible sensible attitudes toward sex and sexuality make a difference between finding beauty of sex in a mature loving relationship and the unfortunate physical and emotional consequences of its irresponsible use. Without preaching, the author offers first the biological facts, followed by a thoughtful discussion of the multiple alternatives facing teenagers of the 1970s. I find this book to be a sound and concise guide to enlightened decision-making for young people growing up in this supposedly sophisticated world. It provides clear explanations of facts about sex and reproduction, offers a detailed account of the menstrual cycle, gives all the latest pros and cons of the various contraceptive methods and then proceeds to the decisions relating to marriage and parenthood. It contains many simplified drawings, an index, a glossary of useful terms, and an extensive bibliography for further reading. Dr. Wellen's warning to today's teenagers is that they should not get carried away with the new sexual freedom which the pill first seemed to bring. As Dorothy J. Worth, M.D., states in the preface, the decisions a girl makes about sex as a teenager today affects her in a way no one could have imagined years ago parents protected girls in the past. Today, the pill protects girls. The mistaken assumption here is that pregnancy is the only concern regarding sexual behavior. Well, life is more complicated than that, and this book attempts to make this complicated subject more comprehensible. Dr. Wellen succeeds in that attempt. I have only minor objections to the author's way of addressing herself to her intended readership of young women. Young men should also be included. 
There are times when Dr. Wellen sounds a bit condescending in her tone, or rather too cute. I hope readers won't be turned off and thus miss a very frank and informative book. I'd recommend the book to each of my four daughters. Pages 13 through 19 Yes, even the eldest would find the content interesting and up-to-date, and Dr. Wellen's message will stimulate thoughtful discussion by a generation which has been inundated with liberating facts as well as myths. As I look back over the last decade, I tend to agree with Dr. Richard Lee, a professor at a Yale School of Medicine, whom the author quotes as saying about his young patients who have been duped into believing that early sexual experience is the normal way of life. The new sexual ideology is as dictatorial and cruel as Victorian prudery. The young seven today have a better control their future choices. This book just that. Get Lieutenant P. Chance than ever to and make healthy can help them to playing around women and extramarital sex. Linda Wolf. New York. New York. William Morrow and Company. 1975. 248 pages, seven dollars and ninety-five cents. Reviewed by Wardle Domeroy, Ph. D. The author interviewed 66 women who had had extramarital intercourse and who were willing to talk about these experiences to her. The sample was selected quite fortuitously, being friends friends of friends, and friends of friends of friends. This sampling procedure makes it difficult to expand the findings to a larger population. Of these 66 women, case histories of 35 were selected as representative of the total or because they were unusual. Women with long-time affairs Sporadic affairs. Brief encounters were examined. Some of the marriages ended in divorce, with others the extramarital intercourse stopped, and with still others it continued as a way of life. In most cases the outside intercourse was detrimental to the marriage, but in some it was neutral and on occasion it appeared to be helpful. The author is non-judgmental and has a reporter's knack of presenting each case clearly, succinctly, and interestingly. The book is written for the lay public but clinicians can also expand their views of the extramarital involvement of women. The main value of the book, as I see it, is to show the wide spectrum of motivations and outcomes for women who have had extramarital intercourse. APR Making Babies An Open Family Book for Parents and Children Together Sarah Botnutstein Photography by Doris Beneath New York New York, Walker and Company, 1974. 48 pages, $5.95. Reviewed by Mary S. Calderon, M.D. The idea of this book is good. After an introduction that states clearly and well that the purpose is to help the parent and young child to increase their communication about sexual things, the left pages contain two or three sentences in large type that are supposed to explain the accompanying picture on the right, eight and also a couple of paragraphs of smaller type that enlarge on how the parent can explain things better. 
but alas, the following will illustrate some of the difficulties. Accompanying photographs of the birth of kittens, the large type states that this is how a baby is born to. But small type for the parent includes the statement that the cat wants to be a mother, an undesirable anthropomorphism. The photo by Landrum Schittles of a sperm penetrating an ovum is not labeled and to the uninstructed eye looks like nothing so much as a ball of string beginning to unwind with its eye idle tail sticking up in the air. The picture of the lovely baby girl states in large type, when she was inside her mommy she knew how to grow to be a baby girl. How? The small type informs the parent that your child can see that this newborn baby is a girl. But the umbilical cord stump has dropped off and the umbilicus is well healed. Newborn The picture of a small boy has the correct caption that every boy has a penis. On another page the caption that every girl has a vagina is also correct but hardly susceptible of visual proof for the inquiring mind of a child who sees only a picture of a new little girl of two. In for photos of two beagles, in two, they are playing together, in two, one is mounting the other. The caption, these dogs are loving each other, with one photo of three children, the small type informs the parent that, your own child, little as he is, already holds the seed of the children he will have some day, thereby compounding the confusion about gender with the added confusion of the present day inexcusable use of an agricultural term. He won't manufacture sperm until puberty. She has cells that will ultimately develop into ova, but never seeds which are plant forms. But alas, the worst is the large type statement that, the baby changes and grows. Now it is almost ready to be born, accompanying a reproduction of one of Leonard Nelson's famous photographs of a fetus within a amniotic sac. The trouble here is that the fetus shown is that of a 76-week pregnancy, about five months away from being born. On the plus side is the small type that tells the parent how to answer the child's question about details of intercourse. The man puts his penis in a woman's vagina so his sperm can go inside to join with her egg. And that's how people start babies. Then the author advises the parent, it is sensible and honest to add that, because it feels nice, people make love together even when they are not starting the baby, a concept that should be acquired by every child very early but that parents find very difficult to put into words. We wish that those who with every good intention want to write in the field of human sexuality would do their homework. Much ignorance is caused by lack of books. Today it can't truthfully be said that there are too many books on the market that simply add to rather than correct misinformation. C.P. Theology and Body. Editor. Philadelphia. Press. 1974. 157 pages. Reviewed by Walter. John Y. Fenton. P.A. Westminster. $6.50. Harrelson. T.H. D. 
This fascinating collection of essays grew out of a conference on theology and body held at Emory University in October 1973. William A. Beersley wrote a fine introduction. The essays are well edited, while still retaining the style and flavor of oral presentations. The subject lends itself to pop theological treatment, and there is just a bit of that in the collection. The carefully reasoned word I Richard Zayner, a phenomenologist and philosopher, tile embodiment as problematic unity is a substantive treatment of the problems faced by theologians and philosophers in dealing with the human body. It alone is worth the price of the volume. Tom F. Driver writes in the third person for a theologian who discovered the muscles of the thigh and thereby came to terms with the body as deeply rooted in the totality of God's good creation or something of the sort. It is a brilliant piece sensuous, imaginative, and powerful. Even if Driver were pulling the reader's leg which I doubt he does so with brilliance and profundity. The opening piece by the start of the conference, Sam Keane, outlines what an erotic theology might look like. It displays Keane's famous storytelling gifts and also shows him working his way back into Christian theology in an impressive and illuminating way. Many of the atheists contrast the place of the human body in Judaism RCECU's report, Make 1975 and Christianity with its place in other religious traditions. They do so with profound respect for what is to be learned from other religious traditions, but still make the point that Judaism and Christianity have very much to say about the inseparability of body and spirit, much that would radically recast the relation of the self to itself and to the world in contemporary Christianity were that heritage more actively a part of Christian existence than it usually is found to be. Bernard Aronson deals with the experience of the body in relation to transcendence, drawing upon experimental work in the psychology of perception. Gwen Kennedy Neville, Cecil W. Cohn and John W. Jill treat briefly the import of the subject of the conference for the experience and concerns of women, blacks, and homosexuals. Their treatments are all too brief and probably reflect a mistake in the setting up of the conference. What they have to say is a very important addition to the book. This is an important contribution to contemporary theology. Lieutenant should be of considerable value to persons outside theology who want to savor the efforts of colleagues to come to terms with several lines of reflection on how theology might look when centered upon the concrete bodily existence of men and women today. PR presented sexuality more realistically, including anti-erotic as well as erotic aspects, were termed erotic realism. The indication was that pornography was the dross, while erotic realism was serious art. Pornography and the law became an oft-referred-to work in obscenity cases and provided almost the only clarity in the censorship maze until the Kinsey Institute for Sex Research and the National Commission on Obscenity and Pornography came along later to add their empirical insights to the phrase. More recently, 
the crone yazans have turned their attention toward the visual arts and have moved from analysis to advocacy by sponsoring three international exhibitions of erotic art in Sweden, Denmark, and most recently, in San Francisco. They have also collected and published a finely printed and expensive two-volume work entitled Erotic Art Slash Slash and I I. The San Francisco exhibition has led to the establishment of a permanent museum of erotic art in that city. And this new and relatively inexpensive book contains reproductions of 138 of the museum's newest acquisitions, along with a brief history of the Krohn Yazan's erotic art crusade entitled Why We Feel the way we do an even more brief introduction to the history of the world's erotic art. In addition there are biographical sketches of the modern Western artists whose works are included in this volume. The book is interesting in its reports of some of the Krohn Yazan's brushes with the law in the pursuit of their interest in erotic art. For instance, on the subject of governmental attitudes toward erotica, even when it can definitely claim the title of art, the certain high-placed official in the U.S. Department of Justice told them as late as 1969 grave accent if you brought into this country a Michelangelo with that subject matter, we would confiscate and destroy it. The authors also muse interestingly about why eroticism, even when it lies obviously of redeeming artistic import this collection includes sexually explicit works by Rodin, Man Ray, George Crush, Pablo Picasso, Jean D. Buffet and Carol Appel among others continues to be such a bugaboo with authority figures especially governmental ones. Their explanation is that such attitudes emanate from a form of cultural elitism which argues that only better educated and well brought up persons are able to eat of the forbidden fruit of the gallery of erotic Eberhard Krohn Yazan. Bantam Books, 1974 Reviewed by Art. Phyllis, New York. $2.95 paper. Jones, Ph.D. And New York. Knowledge without danger of indigestion. The Krohn Yazans believe this attitude not only characterizes the establishment, but is also patently undemocratic. From thence comes their conviction that erotic art has assumed the necessarily political character, and that suppression of it becomes a matter of political censorship. Although the foregoing is certainly a simplistic view of the censorship troubles which even the greatest artworks with frank and stimulating erotic content still suffer from. I would not disagree with it as being one of the roots of that trouble. Perhaps even the taproot. One of the disappointments of this volume is its concentration upon the Japanese shunga for a disproportionate amount of its reproductions. Any word which attempts to represent something of the scope of erotic art, both ancient and modern would have to include not only the Shanga but also the traditional and often religious erotica of India and China. But the hallmark of the Shanga, which differentiates it from all other forms of erotic depiction, is the male chauvinism of the Shanga artists, who always exaggerated the size of the penis making the females seem relatively frail and sexually inadequate.
upon the principle laid down in their earlier work by the Krohn Yazans, it would seem that Shanga is just not good erotic realism, making one wonder at the amount of attention they give to it. APR C. William D. R. S. Phyllis and Eberhard Krohn Yazan the co-authors of this book, have done much to legitimize contemporary interest in, and appreciation for, erotica. Perhaps their greatest contribution so far has been a collection and analysis of eroticism in another art form than this present work literature. This was in 1959 with the publication of Pornography and the Law, a now classic study by the husband-wife team of psychologists, which was the first serious and authoritative attempt to discern a line between pornography and erotic realism. In their earlier work, Material which distorted the realities of sexual nature in the fulfillment of usually male erotic fantasies and in defiance of sexual taboos were termed pornography, while other materials regardless of their explicitness which SIECU's report, make 1975, Tell me why answers to children ask about love sex are polyolcom. New York. Set and Dunlap. 1974. 127 pages. Reviewed by Lester A. Kirk and Diane. Questions and Babies. New York. Grow dollars for dot 95. Ph. D. Dot. The title of this book explains its purpose adequately. Its format, prepared with juveniles in mind, is attractive. For the line drawings, the color contrasts in the print, and the cover itself makes one wish to leave through it. The book has answers to some 200 questions grouped under the three major headings. Love sex, and babies. Most answers running from 50 to 150 words. This brevity, however, means that most questions need much more discussion than they get, and the questions obviously cover a wider age range than childhood. Thus we have, what does the heart have to do with love? And at what age can a nine girl have a baby? To what is a vasectomy? What is the clitoris? And what makes the person a homosexual? Thus the answers, though given to questions that are basically positive in tone, so support traditional and denying attitudes towards sexual expression that they probably will be questioned by those entering or in adolescence. The comments concerning masturbation, homosexuality, and desires for sexual experience are cases in point. The more careful editing job would have helped. Thus the answer to the question do boys have orgasms before girls is really directed to the question do boys generally have orgasms at an earlier age than girls. There are a few factual errors. In intercourse the penis is said to rub against the clitoris. Incest is said to be medically dangerous and likely to produce children who will inherit the worst characteristics, physically and mentally, of both partners. The chances that they may also inherit the better characteristics of both are overlooked. Two questions relate to Catholic opposition to birth control without recognizing that groups other than Catholics may also oppose birth control. 
Both questions cover essentially the same point. Despite these deficiencies, however, the use of this book is better than not to have dealt with the subject at all. The briefness of the answers does suggest a real limitation. The book should not be handed to children with the idea that now that they have something to read, the job is done. It should rather be used as a springboard which will stimulate further question and dialogue an enhanced adult child adolescent openness should be one of the hope for outcomes see at lieutenant p subjects shared in the book include consideration of male and female homosexual relationships persistent and prevalent myths concerning basically homosexual or heterosexual persons homosexual love and the question of marriage particular problems of vocation and work among homosexual persons who are teachers social workers and members of the clergy problems relating to arrest and imprisonment married persons one or both of whom are ambisexual differences between transsexual persons transvestites and homosexual males and sex reassignment the failure to relate humanely to persons of homosexual orientation has led to undue and unnecessary emotional pain social anguish despair fear guilt humiliation and family rejection for many men and women Clinton Jones provides personal insight, sensitivity and wisdom concerning the counseling of homosexuals invaluable to anyone working in the helping professions APR asterisk by invitation. Men and Masculinity Joseph H. Pleck and Jack Sawyer Editors Englewood and J. Spectrum Books Prentice Hall 1974 224 pages $2.95 Reviewed Ph.D. by Derek D. Calderwood That prevent affectionate relationships between males In the sections Men and Work and Men and Society Men examine the ways institutions exploit the masculine role and restrict men's ability to work, play and love freely. The final section, Men's Liberation, includes personal accounts of experiences in male consciousness raising groups and concludes with a manifesto developed by the Berkeley Men's Center. There is an excellent bibliography of books, articles and films. At any price it would be a challenging and worthwhile anthology. Being in paper that at $2.95 makes it available and recommended reading for every male. Women, of course, will profit from it too. APPR how to teach your children about sex harry preston with jeanette margolin md chat swarth ca books for better living 1974 one dollar and 25 cents paper reviewed by matt strong homosexuality r jones press 1974 reviewed and counseling clinton philadelphia pa fortress 132 pages three dollars and fifty cents paper by oh and r hansen asterisk clinton jones an episcopal priest 
has counseled with more than 1,000 men and women whose expressed need for counseling has developed out of their sexual orientation and preferences wise and sensitive counsel is offered here to counselors and other concerned readers. Through the use of case histories of persons with whom the author has established a counseling relationship. 10. Books about male sex roles and man's liberation are beginning to appear. Some of them are clearly dashed off to capitalize on the latest in idea. Men and masculinity fortunately does not fall into that category. The editors have been carefully selective in their choice of articles and essays. The men who have contributed to this volume are an eclectic group and they write from many viewpoints gay and straight student and executive, black and white, married and single and in many moods. With one jarring exception the research report on male child socialization from the 50s all the selections were written in the 1970s. The book opens with a section called Crowing Up Male, in which several men look back at significant experiences that taught them what society expected if they were to be considered masculine. The following section, Men and Children, includes some moving accounts of learning to be a father. Men and Men deals with the fears of homosexuality. The intention of this book is both to fill in gaps in many an adult's mind and to provide a solid basis for dealing with the questions children inevitably ask, state the authors. It meets these goals by not only giving the watts in responding to children's natural questions at various stages of growth and development but it also helps parents give the facts in an honest, simple and non-judgmental manner. As the authors say, acceptability often hinges not so much on what may be said, but how it is said. If read with the open mind the authors wish to encourage this book should help overcome parental inhibitions when talking to their children about human sexuality. The authors are convinced that sexual trauma is unnecessarily rooted in early, negative impressions, gathered long before puberty. It is the parent's duty and responsibility more than any other single source to be fully informed and to be comfortable with the subject of sex so that they can convey healthy, positive concepts to their children about their bodies, their feelings and their relationships with others. The authors emphasize how influential the parents' own patterns of relating and communicating are in how their children will view love, intimacy and commitment. Honest parental guidance, verbal as well as nonverbal, is of Hatsiku's report, May 1975. Most importance from the very youngest years if the child is to grow up with an awareness of personal responsibility, a good self image, and a positive attitude toward human sexuality. Without such preparation, the authors warn that starting to impose dogmatic restrictions on their teenagers without any prior record of supervision is only closing the barn door after the horses have gone. Throughout the book, the point is made animals may copulate, but human beings communicate. Occasionally lack of attention to precise terminology could lead to some misconceptions by children. For example, in discussing how to answer questions about elimination the authors state, just as we let water out of our bodies through the general areas, 
so also we dispose of waste matter through the anus. There are also some questions that are not directly answered. Grave accent Why do some people say abortion is like murder? Is answered by saying the woman has a right to control her own body. I'd like to see this book read by parents, even those who know it all. Unfortunately, the many parents who won't read how to teach your children about sex are the very parents who need it the most, so that they could make things healthier and easier for the parents of tomorrow. Buy it. $1.25 Read it with your spouse. Share it with those children who may be interested and leave it on the coffee table for anyone to browse through. Good discussion should follow resulting in improved communication and understanding all around. P. The Future of Sexual Relations Robert T. and Anna K. Frankur Englewood Cliff, N.J. Prentice Hall, 1974 150 pages, $7.95 two dollars and forty five cents paper reviewed by j robert Malskin, the a the great god technology has replaced the commandments of religion and the pressures of social tradition as the arbiter of sexual relationships in our culture and promises to radicalize our sexual relationships in the future this is the thesis of the future of sexual relations, the pot fury of readings, mostly reprints from various periodicals and therefore quite uneven in value and readability. The essays, grouped into six sections, deal with the new technology of sex, new attitudes toward sexuality, marriage and parenthood their psychological implications from impotence to transsexualism and finally androgyny our future humanhood. The editor's viewpoint seems to be that sexual relationships are going to be better in the future because they will be both looser and, paradoxically, more manipulated computer matter-matching, licensed parenthood, etc. Their guess about the shape of the future is probably as good as anyone else's Robert Frankur's opening essay, The Technologies of Man-Made Sex proclaims that new technologies are artificial insemination, sperm banks, embryo transplants and such are exploding our concepts of male and female and creating the period of apocalyptic discontinuity. Most of the articles are less menacing. George B. Leonard condemns the awful silence surrounding sex in most American families but warns that school-taught sex education might do to sex what our traditional classroom has done to poetry and mathematics. Raymond J. Lawrence opts for marital permanence at the expense of sexual exclusiveness. The author's consensus is that marriage is in trouble today and advocates satellite relationships that will sustain marital loyalty by making room enough for another very personal and intimately emotional friendship, even one involving genital expression. One of the more valuable essays is Jean Ben Stock's Motherhood, an occupation facing decline. She deals directly with how technology is changing the way we feel and think. The book closes on a hopeful note, predicting the diminution of co-regender identity and sexual polarization, and concluding that we are coming to know ourselves as we are, in flux among many aspects of being. APR 
homosexuality from the inside. David Lamers, London, Social Responsibility Council of the Religious Society of Friends, 1973. 45 pages, no price given. Reviewed by Lester A. Kirk and Ball, Ph.D. A thoughtful and sober analysis of what being a homosexual means to the person involved as he slash she attempts to adjust to his or her sexual orientation. Much of the problem arises from the unreadiness of society to accept this sexual preference, and from the difficulties which members of any minority group have as they seek to establish firm and secure roles and meaningful relationships. While the book does not contain case histories and only one or two citations on the experience of individuals it sets forth clearly the numerous forces which come into play. While written within the religious framework of the Society of Friends, the approach is essentially humanistic. APR About The Reviewers Reviews of books, booklets, journal articles and audiovisuals are written by present and former members of the ECIECU's board and staff, unless otherwise noted. Background information about present board members and staff can be found on the back cover of the ECIECU's report. Identification of all others follows. Jean Daly, MD. Departments of Psychiatry and Pediatrics, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore, Maryland. John R. Hansen, Assistant Director, Office of Research and Analysis, the American Lutheran Church, Minneapolis, Minnesota. John Money, Ph.D. Professor of Medical Psychology and Associate Professor of Pediatrics, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore, Maryland. Former SIECU's board members. Audience Keys 2. Level Categories Senior. Indicators. Are high. As a college. The follows. Bold. Type C children general. Letter S adult. Following the elementary public. Book P parents. Reviews. Indicate. The. General. Audience. Level. Grades. Teens clergy. SIECUs. Bet early teens PR professionals, junior high lieutenant late educators, physicians, public report, health may, workers, 1975, nurses, etc. 11. Audiovisual reviews Audiovisual material is reviewed by Derek L. Barryson, FD. D. slash ECUs, Director of Education and Outland Research Services, unless otherwise indicated, sex is not a dirty word. 77 35 millimeter slides. 20 minutes audio cassette and teaching notes. Harper Romedia Department 10 East 53rd Street. New York, New York 10022. Price $85. This audiovisual program Part of Harper Rose How the Health Are You series is essentially an illustrated lecture. 
the kind an instructor might give at the beginning of a human sexuality course at the high school or early college level. It sounds suspiciously like the opening chapter in any of a number of the standard college textbooks in the FI.LD. As a lecture it is a well-organized presentation, providing an overview of some of the social, psychological, and moral issues in the field of human sexuality. Topics touched on are sexuality as an integral part of personality, development of gender identity, childhood sexuality, the language of sex, obsession with sex in American culture, use of sex in the media, and distinctions between sex and love. The program concludes with some provocative questions about the implications changing mores and values will have on our traditional concepts of masculinity and femininity and on sexual behavior. The slides provide a visual reinforcement to the lecture on the audio cassette, but can the inflated price these slides impose on this canned illustrated lecture be justified for the limited purpose it serves? While intended for classroom use this reviewer feels that this program has greater potential for parents groups for the general public to orient them to the need for sex education. What about McBride? 16 mm sound slash color. 14 minutes. CRM Educational Films. Del March. California 92014 Price $150 Rental $15 Can we provide educational enlightenment on the issue of homosexuality by using a filmed episode that reeks with prejudice and homosexual reject 12 Action. What about McBride is an attempt to do so using an open-ended confrontation technique to open up the topic of homosexuality to adolescent audiences. High school students, Ben and John are planning a four-day raft trip and discussing whom they will invite to go with them. John suggests McBride. Ben rejects the suggestion saying he doesn't want to go camping with a fag. John challenges Ben, asking him how he knows McBride is queer. The argument goes back and forth with John asking for evidence and Ben responding with such items as McBride doesn't have a girlfriend. There was a report that he made it with a guy at a party. He's always touching guys when he talks to them, and he associates with individuals who have to be fags. John defends McBride but the argument gets tenser with Ben exploding with the ultimate put down. Would you sleep in the same tent with a fag? At that moment McBride is seen coming up the walk and the episode ends. A short string her at the end features film and TV star Bo Bridges who discusses some of the myths about homosexuality and makes a plea for understanding and acceptance. The open-ended problem-solving technique in educational films has been effectively used to initiate discussion and to explore complex human relationships. And this is undoubtedly the intention of this film. What is likely to happen with this film is that adolescents will focus on the homophobic attitudes of Ben, who will then become an individual case study when prejudice with little or no attention given to the pervasive homophobic mentality of our society in general, especially among males.
before pushing adolescents into a situation where they have to deal with homosexuality on a confrontation level, which this film will most certainly initiate. There exists a far greater need for educational materials and learning experiences that help young people explore the wide range of sexual express science which may or may not include homosexual experiences. There is a need for basic non-threatening factual information about sexuality which includes homosexuality. Unless this kind of preparation is provided, the use of a confrontation and consciousness raising film of this type seems premature with adolescents. It is difficult to see how this film does little more than reinforce existing prejudices about homosexuality. It fails to bring any real understanding of the topic to an impressionable audience who desperately needs this information. The 12-page instructor's guide accompanying this film to offer concise and accurate background information and a good bibliography on homosexuality, as well as helpful suggestions for using the film, but it alone cannot overcome the limitations of the film itself. But is self-image. 135 mm slides. 30 minutes audio cassette, 116th page book. Sensate Media Service, 5436 Fernwood Avenue, Los Angeles, California 90027. Price, $95. This collection of materials is intended for counselors and therapists interested in learning specific techniques of body awareness training. The approach is based on methods developed by William Hartman and Marilyn Fithian at their Center for Marital and Sexual Studies in Long Beach, California. From their extensive work in sexual therapy they have learned how frequently negative attitudes about body image interfere with healthy sexual functioning. The step-by-step -step methods presented in this AV program clearly demonstrate group techniques that can well serve as a model for therapists interested in body awareness training. The techniques shown in this program can be conducted with small groups who are fully clothed, in bathing suits or in the nude. This is an option the group chooses. The participants appearing in the slides of this particular continued on page 15 SIECU's report, May 1975. Journal The Family Coordinator National Council on Family Relations, 1219 University Avenue, SE, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55414 Reviewed by Lester A. Kirk and Ball, Ph.D. Reviewization Process and Its Impact on Subsequent Premarital Sexual Behavior a complex social psychological network of variables which influences premarital sexual behavior was found. Individuals pass through stages from hand holding to kissing to light petting to heavy petting to intercourse. The speed with which one moves through them depends on a number of biological, physical, and social psychological variables such as physical attractiveness, dating frequency, peer group oriented sex education, and adolescent sexual experiences. The Chain of Sexual Decision Making Anne McCreary Jude has a six-stage model for sexual decision-making with considerations and implications inherent at each stage is presented 
emphasis is on the effect various decisions will have upon child, parent, extended family, and society as a whole, and upon long range rather than on short term implications. The model is based on six basic questions Shall there be or not be one intercourse? Two children. Three birth control. Four delivery of child. Five retention of child and six marriage. Homosexuals. Moreover, to toward homosexuals to be associated with ambiguity and cognitive nickel research findings suggestions made are visibility of masculine sexuals may assist the movement, and that the men is well advised to port lesbianism. Negative tie it were found in tolerance of rigidity. Techair reported. That increased male homogamy liberation feminist moved strongly. Sup. January 1975. Changing sexual references in math circulation magazines. Edward S. Farrell and Marnie E. Foster. Within the years 1963 to 1973, six mass circulation magazines. Readers Digest, McCall's, Ladies Home Journal, Good Housekeeping, Time, and Chatelaine, a Canadian magazine, were studied to determine trends as they related to sexual functioning, sex roles, sexual problems, premarital and extramarital intercourse. Changes toward both greater explicitness and more liberal views concerning premarital sex were found. There was some relaxation in those views which have denied contraceptives to teenagers. The effects of a sex education course on the sex role perceptions of junior high school students. Ann Steinman and Anthony P. Jurek. The objective of this research was to find if sex education and sex role information would provide a blend of both intra- and extra-familial satisfaction so far as sex was concerned. This perception was found among male but not the female students. The best explanation of these results seemed to come from the differential socialization of males and females. Throughout childhood males receive less extensive and intense socialization toward the traditional marriage and family than do females. It is important to discuss alternatives to rigid sex role stereotypes with females. Sexualization and premarital behavior. Graham B. Spanier. This is a study of the sexual SIECU's report, Make, 1975 Sexual Sociale. Journal. Of Homosexuality W 72nd Street. New PH. D. Hayward Press. 130 York. New York 10023 Reviewed by Lustra. Public Attitudes Toward Homosexuality. Part of the 1970 National Survey by the Institute for Sex Research. Eugene D. Levitt. Ph. D. and Albert D. Classen, Jr., the A. What are the public's perceptions of and attitudes toward homosexuality? The following findings are reported Sex between same sex persons is much worse than premarital heterosexual intercourse. Many had difficulty feeling that love can exist between same-sex persons. There is a strong distrust of homosexuals in positions of public responsibility particularly when moral leadership is involved. 
almost half agree many strongly that homosexuality can cause civilization's downfall. There were strong objections to public activity dancing, gay bars by homosexuals. 62% say that at least half of all homosexuals are sick. 59% say there should be a law against homosexual acts. Other findings are reported. Males, females, and transsexuals. A Comparative Study of Sexual Conservatism Thomas Cando, Ph.D. Males, females, and transsexuals were asked to endorse traditional sex subscriptions. Men endorsed them more than women and transsexuals were more conservative than men. Men apparently wish to maintain the sexual status quo. The women's liberation movement may cause less conservatism among women. The conservatism of female transsexuals likely results from having undergone an irreversible certainty nude on page 7513. Kirk and all. Fall 1974 Some characteristics of those who hold positive and negative attitudes toward homosexuals. A.P. McDonald, Jr., Ph.D. and Richard G. Games, Ph.D. This study indicates those who support equality between the sexes are less negative about homosexuality. Males making an issue of sexual potency displayed more negative attitudes toward sex education additional listing. See March Summer California University of California Hell Human Sexuality Gust 1. 3 Credits Jacqueline Wright 2. Avenue, San Francisco, Medical Center for counselors A. Rubens, C. A. 94,143. UC. Workshops 75 SR for 1975 complete listing. Write to Dean of Summer Sessions, EFSC, East Stroudsburg, Pod. 18,301. Admin Administration Building Utah the El University Family Life of Utah Education Salt Lake City Workshop Utah 580 R7 July July 14 2 July 25 3 Credits San and Medical Francisco Educators Center CA July 21st 727L Family Counseling Workshop Division of Continuing Right to Society of Utah Salt Lake City Utah 582 R7 Education 84112 12 19 26 3 Credits 1169 Annex University R 2 O Parnassus Virginia University of Virginia Charlottesville VA Bell EDHP 567, Human Sexuality, July 8 to August 14. A Howell, Health Education Ruffner Right 2, Underscore Dr. Keith Versi of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia 22903, Institute, 3 Credits, Hall. Uni 
Southern Connecticut State College, New Haven, Comp. L. Sex Education Institute, June 30 to July 25, six credits. Mr. Arlen Hutchison, Director of Sex Education, right to 501 Crescent Street, New Haven, Comp. 06410, New Staten Island Community College. 0B-030, Biological Approach July 16, 3 Credits, Dean J. Stanley Below, Right to, Ben White 10301, York Staten Island, Ben Y to Human Sexuality, 715 Ocean Terrace. Postgraduate in Sexual June Staten 12th Island 2 Workshops Dysfunction North Carolina University of North Carolina Greensboro Ben C L A G A 560-7 Human Sexual Relationships May 27th to July Credits 0 HEC 412 to 7 Family Relations July 7 to August 12 3 Credits Right to Chamey University of North Carolina Greensboro 27412 2 3 Ben C Reproductive Biology Research Foundation Masters and Johnson announces three six-day workshops on human sexual function and dysfunction during the summer and fall. Dates are June 9 to 14, August 18 to 23, and October 20 to 25, 1975. Fee is $400. Acceptance in the workshop requires application and submission of curriculum vita. For application forms write. Robert E. Simpson, Co-Director Postgraduate Training Programs, Reproductive Biology Research Foundation, 4910 Forest Park Boulevard, Street. Lewis Mill, Missouri 63108 Phone Area Code 3143613777 Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons announces a 3-day seminar for physicians and therapists on human sexual disorders development diagnosis and treatment June 6 to 8, 1975. Fee $150. For application forms, write to Jose M. Ferrer, Jr., M.D., Associate Dean, 630 West 168th Street, New York, New York 10032. Phone Area code to one two five seven nine three six eight two Pennsylvania East Stroudsburg State College East Stroudsburg L Sex Education in Schools June twenty third to July Human Sexuality Part of a Social Health August twenty second three credits Pod thirty one Three credits workshop August four two continued from page I Javier among whites sexual immorality becomes sexual liberation shacking up is called heterosexual cohabitation or an alternative lifestyle etc. 
this society tends to restructure its attitudes and practices when the sexually permissive are female members of the majority group. Hence, birth control and abortion are made more easily available, as are handbooks on how to improve one's premarital sex life. Thus while many of us can agree that sexual enlightenment and abolition of the double standard are marks of human progress, we must also agree that if the same kinds of sexual behavior were found primarily among the black population, the result would most likely be the collective indictment of an entire racial group and concomitant denial of its civil and human rights. As the changes in sexual mores makes it increasingly difficult to make moral distinctions between racial groups, let us hope that cultural differences in sexual behavior will come to be recognized as no more than diversity in the spectrum of possible responses to the sexual stimuli that animate us all. Designations of racial groups as superior or inferior on the basis of their sexual values and behavior have no place in a whether in movies television or popular literature. Such a situation has predictable consequences when the sexually reluctant black female encounters the hypersexualized black male. Conflict ensues as an accommodation between such antagonistic sexual orientations becomes difficult to attain. The fragility of many black male-female relationships is partially a reflection of this unresolved subterranean war between black women who are relatively sexually unresponsive and black men who are sexually exploitative. The black sexuality which could exist without the constraints of white tapping stereotypes would be a healthier form of behavior. In light of these commonly held white views of black sexuality, it is of great interest that, in some circles, whites may actually be engaging in more permissive sexual activity than blacks. This is particularly true of white females who are beginning to unleash with a vengeance all of the pent-up sexual feelings they have had to suppress for years. The racist motivation behind the previous labeling of blacks as sexually immoral is quite clear as we currently witness the redefinition of behavior that was once alleged to be peculiar to blacks. More euphemistic terms are applied to the same B14 rational and humanistic society. FIECU's report, May 1975, EA as FIECU's moves increasingly into areas of broad public concern the Board of Directors invites all of our supporters to join with us as FIECU's associates. As an associate you will be joining with more than 1,000 professionals in the field of sexuality working towards a mature and rational society in which sexuality will take its rightful place as a natural and positive force in human life. Your tax-deductible contribution not only supports SIECU's it permits you to participate more actively in its activities. Your associate card entitles you to fellow one-year subscription to SIECU's report L an annotated bibliography on human sexuality L a special discount on all SIECU's publications and reprints L reduced registration fees at SIECU's conferences of general interest L advance notice and reduced fees to any SIECLJ's conference.
limited to your professional field. L reduced price and invitation to the annual SIECU Citation Dinner which this year will mark SIECU's 10th birthday L news on new developments related to sexuality as they occur L the opportunity to support SIECU's as an informational source in your community. This is your chance to share in the contribution SIECU is making to enrich the lives of present and future generations through a better understanding of human sexuality. We hope you will accept our invitation to join with us in this vital work. SIECU's 122 East 42nd Street Suite 922 New York New York 10017 My check is enclosed $25, $15, $50, 0 organization, 0, 0 sustaining patron, $500, $100, and over $50. I wish to become an associate of the Sex Information and Education Council of the U.S. in the following category by three regular zero student q contributing name mailing address city state zip profit dot slash bus dot affiliation position journals continued jerry her investment from and page the news 73 STA. T use is heavy and she can muster demands all the zeal to names to wardrobes to personalities. John Money Ph. D. For some who consider sex reassignment, Ambivalence over choice may continue until the fourth or fifth decade of life, at which time it becomes a compulsion. Some have legal, financial and moral commitments which must be resolved if reassignment is to be successful. Gender role identity becomes established developmentally through a complex intermingling of identification, that is, becoming like members of one's original sexual assignation, plus becoming able to reciprocate the behavior of the other sex. The Atasca Arrow Project Model of a sexual retraining program for incarcerated homosexual pedophiles Michael Serber M.D. and Chlordiag Keith M.A. This describes the sexual retraining program at a maximum security prison hospital that houses primarily pedophiles. It consists of desensitization and education of the prison staff, cooperation with gay groups and sexual retraining of homosexual pedophiles in the direction of adult homosexual behavior. The paper reviews the psychiatric literature which maintains that homosexuality is a psychopathological condition. It suggests that in the criminal system homosexuals justice should be provided meaningful social and psychological services. Psychological Test Data on Female Homosexuality The Review of the Literature Bernard F. Rees, Ph.D. Jean Safer, M. A. and William Yadav The Critical and Comparative Review of Existing Studies on Responses by Female Homosexuals to Projective and Non-Projective Tests much data is contradictory, but there is some consistency of findings. 
Female homosexuals seem to differ from male homosexuals in psychodynamics and to have no more psychopathology than heterosexual female controls. SIECU's report, May 1975. Audiovisual continued from page 72 program are in the new dot they represent a range of body shapes and sizes and age. Real people, not playboy or playgirl models. The narration on the cassette spoken by the male and female group leaders explains the procedures. Starting with drawing a picture of oneself on newsprint, standing clothed in a circle and sharing the reasons behind one's choice of clothing on this particular day, disrobing and standing in front of a foot-length J-way mirror and commenting on one's feelings about all parts of the body from head to toe. Comparing one's own perception of one's body with the perception of others in the group. Throughout the sequence of activities the group leaders, who are themselves participants in the group, play a supportive role. One man speaks with pride of the scar on his chest from open heart surgery that to him symbolizes a new life. A woman shares her positive feelings about the stretch marks on her abdomen which remind her of her role as a mother of which she is justifiably proud. Viewing these slides and listening to the process on the audio cassette is something of a liberating experience in itself. For those therapists who have doubts about new group experiences as a therapeutic activity, viewing this training model should at least lower the anxiety level. For many the methods and techniques of sex therapists are still the source of curiosity and titillating interest. It is commendatory that Hartman and Fithian and their colleagues have shared with other professionals through audiovisual media the approaches and techniques of one aspect of their pioneering work in helping people to learn how to like themselves. If limited budgets prohibit the purchase of this complete program, one can get the essence of the body awareness training techniques by reading the 116th page illustrated book which can be purchased separately for $3.95. 15. Grave Accent SIEC Use of Officers 1975 J. No L. Macy, Washington, D. C. 1. Robert Campo S. K. I. N. New York. New York M. A. Chairperson Wardle 8. Pomeroy. Ph. D. Past Chairperson Air Gallon S. Gentle. M. D. Vice Chairperson Salem P. Bell. Ph. D. Reacher the Children. M.D. Met Strong Secretary the Ref. Leon Smith. Dead. D. Treasurer Georgianese Gray. Haskell Coplin. Ph. D. Professor of Psychology Amherst College Amherst, Massachusetts the Ref. Foster Q. Don't. Westone School Westone, Pennsylvania Lorna Brown Flynn, Washington, D.C. The ABA, B.D. Robert J. Levin, M. A. Articles Editor Red Book Magazine New York, New York E. James Lieberman, M.D. Hamp P.H. Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry Howard University Medical School, Washington, D.C. Harold I. Leaf, M.D. Director, 
Marriage Council Philadelphia, Inc. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Richard A. Myron, LL.B.J. D. Dean, School of Criminal Justice, State University of New York, Albany, New York, Wardleby Pomeroy, Psychotherapist, New York, New York, Ph.D. SIECU's Board of DIRECTOX is 1975. Gallant P. Bell, Ph.D. Senior Research Psychologist, Institute for Sex Research, Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana, Diane B. Brashier, Private Practice, Indianapolis, Indiana, MSW, Ph.D. Philip M. S. A. R. R. E. L. M. D. Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology Director, Yale Sexuality Program Yale University School of Medicine New Haven, Seed Necticut Larry Polsk L. Personnel Director to Shape, Cross and Company Newark, New Jersey The Ref, James A. Ersidi F. Case B.D. Director for Discovering Ministries The American Lutheran Church Minneapolis, Minnesota Isaiah Zero Quantimoto, Ph.D. Assistant Professor, Department Sociology and Applied Behavioral University of California Davis, California The Ref. William H. G. N. N. E. Coordinator of Family Ministries National Council of Churches New York, New York Perry General Dallas, E. Gross, Practice Texas, M.D. of Sciences, M. A. B. D. Robert C. Long, M.D. Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Director. Division of Human Sexuality University of Louisville School of Medicine Louisville, Kentucky W. Ray Montgomery Realty Trust Company Dallas, Texas President William P. Brown, Ph.D. Professor of Criminal Justice School of Criminal Justice State University of New York, Albany New York June Dodds Butts, Ed. D. Associate Professor Division of Public Health University of Massachusetts Amherst, Massachusetts. John L. S. Holloman, Jr., President, Health and Hospitals City of New York, New York, New York. M.D. Corporation. Donald A. Chittle, Ph.D. President John J. Kalash of Criminal New York, New York Rabbi J.D.S.H.I.H. Nipser, Temple Chambery M. Una Montclair, New Jersey E.T.H.E.L.R.I.N.D. Shaw, R.N. Assistant Professor School of Nursing Ohio State University Columbus. Ohio M. S. Justice Ed. D. Albany. The Ref. Leon Smith. Ed. D. Director of Educational Ministries in Marriage, United Methodist Church, Nashville, Tennessee. Met Strong Greenwich, Connecticut. Frankie Taylor, Editor. Frankie Taylor Books slash Preger, New York. New York. Jacqueline Johnson Jackson, Ph.D. D. Associate Professor of Medical Sociology Department of Psychiatry Duke University Medical Center Durham, North Carolina Marcus H. Jazz, A.B. Senior Vice President and Editorial Bantam Books, Incorporated, New York. 
New York G. Will Jones, hl.th.ph.d. Associate Professor of Film Art Southern Methodist University Dallas, Texas Garrett F. Kelly, m.ed. Director Student Development Center and Program in Human Sexuality Larson College of Technology Potsdam, New York Lester A. Kirkin Ball, Ph.D. Professor Emeritus of Family Life Education Oregon State University Corvallis, Oregon Rabbi Bernard K. L. I. G. F. E. L. D. M. A. Temple Emanuel of Long Beach, Long Beach, New York Daniel H. Labby, M. D. Professor of Medicine and Psychiatry University of Oregon Medical School Portland. Oregon Director Michael Carrera, Ed. D. Associate Professor of Health Education Community Health Education Program Hunter Kalash School of the Health Sciences New York. New York Richard S. E. H. I. L. G. R. B. N. M. D. Director Program in Human Sexuality University of Minnesota Medical School Minneapolis, Minnesota F. Allen S. G. N. D. E. L. M. D. Director Division of Maternal and Child Health on Leave Kansas State Department of Health to Pirka, Kansas George Anise Great Chairman of the Board Capital City State Bank and Trust Co. to Pirka, Kansas. Ralph F. Selvinko, Ph.D. Professor Wayne State University Law School Detroit, Michigan Helen F. Southard. M.A. Acting Director, Data Center National Board, YWCA New York. New York Wilhelmina Thomas Principal. Walker Jones, Washington, D.C. Elementary School Grave Accent FIEC Use Advisory Panel 1975 M.D. Health Robert L. Barnstein Psychiatrist in Chief Department of University Yale University New Haven, Connecticut Earl UBELL Director, Local TV News New NBC and New York, New York Vernon E. Wilson, MD, Vice Chancellor for Medical Vanderbilt College, Nashville, Tennis and A. York, Derek D. Calderwood, Associate Professor of H and A. New York University School, New York. New York. Ph.D. Education of Education. Ethics. George CCHAM Vice. Ph.D. Coordinator. Family Life Education Flint Community Schools Flint, Michigan. Program. Asterisk board and advisory far dot for members are not serving SIECUs as representatives of their organizations, but as individuals. SIECUs Staff Administrative Assistant Agnes Pilgrim Executive Director and Director of Educational Publications Mary and Her S. Calderon, Research Services Albert Listen, M.D. Dead. D. D. Hamp Ph. U.S. Postage, Sex, Information, N Street, New, Education York, Ben Y. Council 10017, of the U.S. New York. Permit No. Ben White 3696.
120 to East 42nd, 